All right, so let's get started. Um, let's welcome uh, Felix, Philip, and Sönke from Blue Yonder. They will talk about exploratory time series analysis of the New York City subway data. So welcome and go for it. Yeah, hi, and thank you all for coming. Um, so we thought we'd um, uh, basically walk you through a time series analysis problem and along the way explain some of the concepts um, that, that matter in this case. Um, because it's not quite your regular machine learning problem, there are some special properties and approaches uh, specific to time series. Um, why can we talk about this? Because this is something that uh, uh, we do kind of regularly in our, in our daily work. So. Uh, we work at Blue Yonder. By the way, we have a, a little social event uh, tonight. If you want to participate, we have a booth downstairs. Uh, just meet us there. Um, yeah, just wanted to mention that. Um, the idea is that um, in this tutorial, you get exposed to some of the concepts that matter in, in time series analysis. Um, I'd like to show you some of the challenges you face when you do that and how we approach those tasks. This is not the only way to solve it. Um, most importantly, get you to dive into an example problem and do your own experimentation and, and um, yeah, maybe learn something along the way. So uh, we'll try to explain stuff. If you have a question, um, don't hesitate to, to raise your hand. There are three of us. There's always one who can rush to you and, and answer any question if you get stuck or anything. Um, but also, don't worry if you get stuck. If, if there's any kind of intermediate result uh, that we develop that you need for a later step, we actually provide all those intermediate results. If you kind of fall off the, the tracks, uh, um, then we have the, the inter intermediate data also um, in our sample data set. So uh, with that said, uh, let's make sure you all have the required uh, Python modules and the sample data. So. Uh, I listed here the, the packages that you need. Um, the simplest way to, to get this all installed is if you have Conda already, um, if you just clone the, the GitHub repository, uh, we have requirements files that you can just use to install all the packages. So if you, if you start by, by cloning that, you f you'll find uh, the requirements files and um, the sample data that we use and the uh, IPython notebooks that we use. And uh, if you have any kind of problem doing that, just wave, raise your hands, and we'll help. And if that doesn't work, it's just the packages that are listed there. Uh, it should be there. If it's not, then you can just install the, the packages by their name. Just conda install uh, numpy, scipy, scikit-learn, pandas, and ipython notebook. And if you do that, you should be able to, to start an, an ipython notebook. So most of these packages are well known. We're using one package that was developed inside our company that we open sourced. That's the PyDSE. 
uh, package and right now it's tagged with a slightly unusual pre-release version string. That's why you have to give this extra option when, when you pip install it. And that's only on PyPI, so there's no Conda uh, package for that yet. So we also are going to need the PyDSE. Does that work for everybody? Okay. Okay, somebody, anybody get getting stuck or can we just continue? Okay, cool. So um, now let's look at the, the task. Uh, we're the proud owners of, these, of this little food car and uh, it's uh, our home spot is uh, a subway station exit. And, um, well, this is not just a, a funny story to have a background for, for what we're doing. Um, it will actually influence our solution, uh, as you will see later on. So uh, this is not an, an academic exercise, but it will actually influence uh, uh, our solution in the end. So we're selling pretzels in the street. Um, and... Every day we have to decide how many pretzels we buy for the next day. So we have to kind of make sure we don't buy too many and we don't buy too few. Um, uh, ideally we buy the exact amount that we're going to sell the next day. And we can use basically our experiences from the past um, to make a prediction how many people are going to, to buy something on the next day. So uh, the good thing is that um, we have really nice data to do this. Uh, we will use the data from the subway station turnstiles that the uh, New York City MTA is collecting. So uh, they um, are actually really nice and provide uh, data. Uh, I think they are just starting to provide it through an API. Uh, when we got the data, it was still a download. Basically what it is, it's the enter and exit counts of the turnstiles at every station, aggregated over four hours, um, and uh, you can actually get the history of the past several years. Um, and this is what we'll be working with. And now I hand over to my colleague uh, to take you, um, yeah, to, to have a first look at the, at the data. Has to be Genau das hier. Damit kann ich arbeiten. Musst du auch schreiben? Was? Nee, ich muss nicht schreiben. Ich muss nur lesen. So everyone can read. So before we start diving into um, our data, I just want to go the raw data and show how we refine it and aggregate it to, to our problem, uh, to use it for our problem. So we have some more time to do more uh, the model developments. Yes? You can hide the menu. What? What? You view, you can hide the menu. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I hope everyone has downloaded um, the files from the repository. So we start with um, importing the packages and loading the data into a pandas data frame. So first we've got a look at, at the head of the data, so get a feeling what's in it. 
So actual the, the downloaded data from the MTA has more information. So it has information about the nodes um, at which uh, the, the stations are connected to. But here I already refined it to um, timestamp, number of entries, number of exits, and the station name. So we are talking about the station of Fulton Street. The data starts at the 23rd of May 2010. And we, we see we've got 686 entries in the time interval um, between the day before, four hours until um, midnight, and 751 exits. Um, yeah. So in... So I'm scrolling down. So if we want, if we plot the time series, okay, we see oh, what's that? We've got some spikes at nearly two million exits or entries at our time. That's really really bad. So it seems we've got a data problem. So, okay. So we replace those implausible values. No, no one has millions of exits at an in interval of four hours. Um, and we are putting in another number. So let's do that. OK, and plot again. OK, plot again. So we've got a time series. We've got about 5,000 to 24,000 exits. We are just looking at exits in our exercise, um, just for simplification. So our time series goes from June, uh, from end of May 2010 until end of 2013. And um, later on, we divide this um, time series in an in-sample and out-of-sample part for model testing. I'll talk about that later, later on. So, going back. So now we are checking this, this time series for gaps. Okay, so time value counts. So we've got some, we expect four hours intervals in this data, but we also have eight and 16 hours interval. So I looked into the data and every Saturday interval, uh, Saturday morning is missing in the data. I don't know why, and we have to deal with it because we want we want a time series without gaps. So here you see there's a gap between eight o'clock in the evening and four o'clock in the morning. There should be a midnight data data set. So what can we do? For example, we can interpolate it with a linear function. Pandas provides this, so we interpolate, and we look again at the time series, and you can see we've got now a value for midnight, which is 2060 plus 189 divided by two. So very simple, but for our purpose, it's just enough. Then we aggregate it to a daily time series. We want to have a sum number of exits per day, and we add some columns we need later on, like year, month, day, and weekday. Weekday, the so counter between zero and six. Monday is zero, Sunday, Sunday is six, so put it in. And as I mentioned before, we define a in and out sample by a flag, and we set it on 2013. The whole year is our out of sample. Um, test data and the training data is just the time series between 2010 and 2012. And then we save it. So, so I just wanted to show you, so we prepared this notebook to show you um, that no data is perfect and you have always to manipulate the data to, to model it later on. Depends depending on your purpose. So just going to show you the slide back to the slides. Uh, Felix? Mm -hmm. 
which one? Who is it? Zu, zu, zu den Folien. Okay, so we're the data source. Now we are talking about the model. So the next notebook will be interactive. Um, I want to inv invite you to um, browse through this aggregated data and make some plots. So if, if you go to um, the notebooks and go to the tutorials, to the second notebook, you want to start after I explain you what I what a framework for the model we want to use. As I mentioned before, we've got an in-sample and out sample data flag. We want to use that in all our model comparisons later on. We are talking about Horizon 1. So um, in the example, we've got some data and we've got um, here the truth and we want to predict in the morning of the 4th May, the number of exit this day. So, for example, if we calculate a rolling mean, which is just the mean, three day mean um, of, of those numbers, uh, it's 3167, uh, it's a prediction from yesterday, we using, um, using, the, uh, using data in the, the history, and so you see it's shifted. And it's not a good estimate for 6,200. So <laughs> as you can see, it's, it's just an example that you have to shift the data and, um, looking for, uh, for comparison between truth and prediction. Um, for comparison, we chose um, the mean average, I mean absolute error, which is defined on the next slide. It is just the absolute um, deviation between truth and prediction divided by the number of events. So I want you now to go to the notebook. What is it? So to the data exploration part. Is this its tutorial or tutorial? No, I will not in this. This is okay to the tutorial. Okay. So I want to start. Want you to start um, the first two parts. So just load the packages and the data, and then we look. Okay, what do we have? We've got the exits per day aggregated, the year, month, day, and weekday in the sample. Um, How much time do we have? Okay, so. I want you uh, the next five minutes to just do some plots, ask us questions, what you see, and um, we've got some suggestions um, put down, plot time series, week profile, month profile, just play around with the data. So uh, what do you mean by week profile? Um, just plot, uh, for example, you've got a weekday, okay. and the mean numbers of, of exits per weekday, okay. or was the in sample or out sample or combined sample. So the plot of the average for every Monday, for every Tuesday, for every Wednesday, and so on. It's what's common to every Monday, common to every Tuesday. The the prototypical week. If you're annoyed by the matplotlib windows popping up, does anybody not know how to activate inline plots? And say again? Percent? It's percent uh, matplotlib inline, yeah. And then you got uh, the plots in the in the notebook, yeah.
an die Tasse gewöhnen. Wo ist das Anführungszeichen? Wo ist das Anführungszeichen? Bei der Tastatur? Ich tippe normal Deutsch inzwischen. Ah. Bisschen Tempo machen? Okay. Geht das jetzt noch? Das ist keine. Ach so. Ja, 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 ja ich hab's gesehen. Ich bin nicht so der Fan von Lux, ganz ehrlich. Mein Rechner. <lacht> Felix, wo ist das? Das ist das Leid. Was? Ah, Fragezeichen. <lacht> okay. Ctrl L, oder? Mhm. Ja. Äh, Nochmal die Telefonie angekappt. 
Ach so. So for those um, who missed the first slide, so everything you need is in one GitHub repository. If you clone this, you will, you will get the data, the notebooks that we prepared, and requirement files to install all the packages either for the or the it just just go the repository in the last line. So uh, I would also suggest that I would like to invite you to again play a little around with the data for yourself. We have listed a few ideas here in this notebook and given you a few links to the relevant standards functions. That's actually something that's really typical for statistical modeling is starting with a really trivial model first, because in many, many cases, you have nothing to compare your fancy, shiny model uh, to. So you need a reference all the time. And then uh, you almost all the time start with a really trivial model, basically as the baseline to compare yourself uh, to. Um, so this is not just a just to, to, to mess with you, to make you work more, but this is actually a very standard practice. You, you have like the simplest model that you could think of, uh, and that's the first one that you implement. And then you go and implement the next one, and then you can see the differences, and you can see what you actually uh, achieve by using fancy machine learning techniques. And it's sometimes humbling. Das ist 
Das ist jetzt bitte die Deadline-Frage. Ich habe das nicht gesagt, ich bitte, ich habe das nicht gesagt. Ich habe das Das ist eine absolute Abweichung, die die Anzahl einträgt. 
Also das war jetzt das ungefähr 500 Anträge. Das ist nicht eng, eins zu tausend pro Hand. Und dann jede Abweich ist gleich eins bis vierzehn Hundert. Das war das andere. 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 Way we solve this problem here. So again, we import the data, we import the evaluation function. So, this is again the trivial models. So, then we uh, basically define a function that um, calculates a rolling mean a slow-moving, exponentially-weighted average, and a fast-moving, exponentially-weighted average. And uh, we apply it to the data. Then we are interested in moving averages that um, take into account just the same weekday. So for as a prediction for one, say, Monday, we want to have a Moving averages, moving average calculated from all past Mondays. So um, we do this in a group by. So we group the data frame by weekday, and then again apply the function that calculates the moving averages. So the last step here, this is this line. We have to shift everything by seven days for the weekday averages, or by one day for the normal moving averages, just to make sure that we don't include the target itself in the, in the prediction. That would be cheating. Why is this taking so long? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. We have to close the bigger, bigger So and then we can, using this evaluate function that we um, just introduced, we can compare these models and see which performs better than and which, which performs best. So these um, exponentially weighted moving averages are not useful only as predictions models in themselves, but can also be used as building blocks for more complex prediction models. So for example, we could um, take a slow moving average, a fast moving average, or a moving averages with different time constants, and then use them as input for regression models, say linear regression, or any non-linear regression that you like, gradient boost, for example. So this is what we did here in the third notebook. So, but since we are running out of time, I would suggest that we skip this one. Just have a look at it yourself if you like to. And we uh, go on with um, multiplicative models and armor models.
So, <coughs> just <coughs> to specify the armor model, so we are using a package from our comp, uh, which um, um, Florian Wilhelm from our company uh, designed. It's called PyDSE. Um, it's a little bit easier to use uh, than the stats model armor. And just for your information, I put in two links. Um, if you want to know more about the armor model and the ARIMA models and seasonal armor models, which I cannot explain in detail in this session, just click at the links. I think this is a quite nice um, explanation on these links. Just try it out. So just in, in brief, we've got an armor model. Armor stands for auto regressive moving average and N and M are the orders of those models. So it's composed of um, a noise term, epsilon, the armor, uh, the auto regression term, which just defines um, in first order, for example, you know something happens yesterday and ha it has an influence till today or, and so on. And the moving average we just had um, is the epsilon and the B is just a um, coefficient. So if you want to model with ARMA, you have to look at the partial autocorrelation functions and the autocorrelation function plots. So in, the, in a very simple example, if something depends on yesterday and yesterday depends on the day before and so on, uh, usually you've got an ACF plot which is slowly degrading. You've got a peak at zero, which is one, as usual, per definition. Then the, uh, um, the second maximum is at one, and it degrades. And if you look at the partial autocorrelation, and if you take out all the collations in between, you have got a peak at one, because everything is explained with the first lag of time shift. So just as a reminder. OK. Um, let's go to the notebooks. Um, insert tutorial. So before we start with with ARMA, I have to explain ARMA is not very good with non-stationary cases. So in our example, if you had a glimpse at the yearly dependence of the data, so we've got a, a strong trend. So at 2010, we've got 12,000 exits in 2011 more and 2013 nearly 25, 26,000 exits. So at first you have to remove the linear trend. Just do an ordinarily square fit, remove the trend. Um, again, the simple armor model we are talking about is not very good with seasonal effects. And we know, okay, we have a strong seasonal component, the months in winter we've got low numbers, in summer we've got higher numbers. And we've also a weak weekly profile, which is not very good for a simple armor model. So the idea is, is to first remove those trends. Just I want to I want you to do that, <laughs> and we show the result later on. Just um, divide by um, a factor which has uh, which is a dictionary like first month is a mean of one point something and so on. And do the same with uh, with a week after you've got after you removed the trend. I prefer um, just as an idea, prefer a multiplicative model, um, just because I don't like negative numbers and we don't have negative exits. <laughs> just um, try try that out. Try um, the armor model from PyDSE. There's some documentation. There, um, just, I just want to click there and show you what we've got. Oh, no, <laughs> offline, okay, sorry, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> um, you just need the constructor and uh, it's quite easy to handle. So it's just, you have just to, um, to calculate uh, the parameters and it's, everything's automatic. So you don't have to do a lot. So I hope. We'll get you. You will get there that you've got uh, at least um, a, fact, a factor model, um, and if you're lucky, you you have got a, armor, a very easy armor model. 
Okay. Hm? Ja. So. Solution ist hier. At first, just read in the data and to remove a trend, if you just just a glimpse, we're doing a linear regression, fit, predict, and do a trend removal. This is Martha's erste. So we've got about 15 to 20, 20 minutes for that part, which is quite short, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> Thank you. 
So if you're new to pandas and you, you struggle with the, the notation or, or the way things are done, you can, of course you can basically just cheat, open the solution notebook and, and click your way through that um, and go to the more advanced parts uh, where the actual modeling is done. What we are doing here is just building a time index just for the linear fit. And we're looking at the time difference uh, from 1st of January 2010. Oh, it's, it's already done. And then we define our in sample, out, um, use the time index as x, and the quantity want, we want to predict is y, and we import from SK, SK learn linear model and do a linear regression and do the fit, and then we do a prediction and fill the result into a column in our data frame. And if we plot that, it looks like it's not very good visible, it's just the, the, the green line, and you see there's a linear trend and we want to remove that, and for that purpose, just we divide by the trend. This is it. So that's a detrended plot, and you can see, okay, it's not perfect. We've got still some fluctuation, and we've got still a seasonality, and we want to remove those parts, so we still uh, at least have only this real time series. So, okay, we've got the factor model, which we define as trend times weekday times months factor. We do a group by of the exits without the linear trend and fill it into a dictionary. So we want to remove that factor, we just divide by, by this factor in the dictionary depending on the weekday. We also do that afterwards, after we divide it by the weekday and the trend, we divide by the months. You can also permutate that, doesn't matter. And at the end we've got a time series without linear trend, without weekday and monthly profile. Uh, and let's plot that time series. So you can see it's more or less a fluctuation around one. We've got some spikes at the end. Well, so not everything is a plain bow by, by this um, factor model. So, and if we want to look how well this very simple factor model performs, it's a static model because you've got only coefficient, uh, coefficient uh, depending on three factors. We can look at that. We define the model. Then we do in sample, out of sample. We apply this. We fill a column and we import our evaluation function. And then we look, okay, how good is this on the training sample? Well, 6,700 is okay, but you see it's not matching all the fluctuations, it's very static. Okay, and out of sample it looks like that. So, it's just um, the data from 2013. But it still models uh, the monthly dependency and the, the trend and also the week, week dependencies because you've got all this up and down pattern. But the mean, average, the mean absolute error is not so good, 8,900. So if you want to put this into perspective, um, some people um, use a relative uh, error um, so they divide by the mean number of exits in this example. So we've got 
I don't know it by, by heart, it's about 25,000, so you've got um, a percentage error of about 9 to 27, about um, 0.33, so 33% deviation. So that's, if you, in, in, um, if you're talking to your customer and mail order and everything, uh, this um, quality, forecast quality is not very handy, but not very, um, <laughs> um, you, you don't know what the number means. So 9,000, what can you do with that? So it's just divided by the mean number of exits and you got something um, relative. Okay, so shall I uh, go on with the armor model with, or do you want to have more time? It's off? So, okay, we do the armor model on the detrended and factorized data. We define a residual for input and okay, now we load. At first I, um, I had some talk about on the slides about this autocollation plot. As I explained, you got the peak per definition at zero and then, then at the first leg, second leg and so on, it's degrading, okay. And that's the error band and if it's below the error band, there's no real correlation anymore. Okay, let's have a look at the partial autocollation. If this degrading comes only from dependency of one leg to, to each other. And you can see you've got a huge peak, it's one. So we've got more or less on this detrended series, um, an autoregressive model of one. Okay, so let's import modules. Oh, what the hell? No model number page. Okay. Oh, guck dir mal nach. Starten, ne? Nee, nee. Hm? Ja, kein. <lacht> Ist ohne. Ohne PyDC geht's nicht. <lacht> okay, we have to do it without plots and <lacht> without actual data. <lacht> so, we just import um, from PyDC the module mini C and armor. The mini C is um, it's very handy if you want to want to uh, if you don't know what parameters to, to give um, to your armor model. You've got the AEC Akayama what's the information criteria and the Bayesian the BIC um, and this function has some parameters. The first one that's for the autoregressive part. If you got an order of one, two, three, you can put in this list. And also for the moving averages, a warning, uh, it's not very fast because you've got a lot of combinatorics if you've got a lot of factors. So if you're not sure if you've got a autoregressive one, moving average one model, you can try out, okay, one comma two, one comma two, and it looks, um, what is the minimal AEC or BEC, and then it calculates the autoregressive legs and the moving average legs. So in our case, um, we looked at the plots and decided, okay, we'll take um, autoregressive model without moving average part. So just our legs is one. If we want to take a, a moving average model into account, we would put in one comma, what's the comma? Yeah. So we would, yeah. So we would put in a one comma one. That would be um, a ARMA one comma one model. <laughs> okay. Okay. 
So it should work now. Yes. <laughs> okay, just I just remove that part. And okay, that's the main part. Now we know um, our legs. It's just one very simple autoregressive model. We, um, <coughs> we construct our armor, which got some A and B, which if you look at the definition in Wikipedia and the literature, and also the PyDS E definition, um, while the A is for the RR R part, the B for the MA part, and got, we've got a random state. And then we fix constants and we estimate parameters with our data. So that's all. Take some time and we've got a status report with different information. So very important, okay, we've got one parameter, the X is fitted and it's terminated successfully. If you've got more parameters on your armor model, it can be that it's not terminating successfully and you've got a warning here and your model is not good <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so, okay. What do we have? We want to do a prediction. Okay. That's on the data before the transformation. We've got 0.22. Okay. What does it mean? Okay, we've got on the other part 1.7. So we do a back transformation of the data into the exit space. And okay, we've got an in sample mean absolute error of 2,888. That's very good because beforehand we had with our EMOF models and everything else, we had about 5,000, 8,000. So it's a quite good number. So let's go look at the out sample. Okay, it's a little bit worse, but we've got a higher number of exits there. So it's a quite nice and promising model just with the easy autoregressive part of one. So if we zoom in, you can see, okay, the weekly distribution looks fine. The absolute number looks okay. We've got some here, we've got some, uh, at the end of the year, we've got some um, holidays. So that's not a good holiday model, but in the whole, it's, it's very promising. So, and we want to check if our new model has any dependencies on, on the legs anymore. Let's just we plot the deviation between the fit and the truth. And okay, no autocorrelations anymore. That's good. What's with the partial autocorrelation? Oh, it's fine too. We've got no partial autocorrelation with leg one anymore. So that's fine. So the last notebook, I think we've got still from quarter of an hour. We want to talk, okay, we've got now a model, we've got um, a prediction, which at least is usually it's a mean. It's okay. What can we do with that? So let's look at our solution. That's the last notebook. Okay. So just go through that. At first, Everything here is, is a, a probability density distribution. So we want, okay, we are predicting the mean, but actually we want to have a distribution. Why? Why don't we want to have a distribution? Let's look at first at the data. And we can see we've got a histogram and that's all the exits over all the time. Well, I try to fit, well, uh, tried several fits and Right now I chose um, a gamma function, which has two parameters, uh, which can be translated to mean and variance. So if you want to model a gamma function, you need two parameters in your prediction at least. So that's just the, the true histogram and it's normed to one. Okay, so at the beginning we were talking about um, selling pretzels, so we have to buy pretzels. So what's the estimator we want to use? Um, and why did we take a linear um, error um, quantity like the mean absolute deviation or error? Uh, 
first we've got a problem. Um, you're buying, uh, you're, you're, uh, your prediction is too high or too low. It's linear because we want to buy um, pretzels and uh, it's, the cost function is directly correlated. It's linear because we want to, at first we want to um, weigh every event the same. We could take a quadratic error, mean squared error. But then you would take outliers um, more into account than, than the other values. Um, let's see, what do we have? We've got um, the distribution, which I defined, piecewise, and we've got um, a linear cost function. Assume linear cost function. Okay, not selling one pretzel, one dollar, throwing away one pretzel, one dollar. So if we are perfect, we would have no costs. <laughs> Okay, so just this is blot. Okay, define it. Well, what's that? Some distribution not defined. Okay, I skipped that one. Okay, um, I have to go to back to the slides. Uh, got one slide to the cost functions. So here we've got the symmetric cost functions, as I told you before. That's for predictions, that's the truth. And we want to know, okay, we've got, uh, let's say here we've got the true distribution of our exits. And we say, okay, each, each one of these exits buys one pretzel. Which is not true, but <laughs> at least it's an, it's an estimate. And Okay, we want to minimize this function, so we convolute it with the distribution um, of our forecast. In, in the notebook, I take the true contribution, uh, true um, distribution, because I didn't want to construct a, a, um, um, probability density. Okay, we convolute it, and that works for every distribution. You can take because of the definition, it's one, and if you calculate it, if you've got a linear cost function, the minimum of, uh, of this convolution is always um, for uh, the, best, uh, the best estimate is always the median. So here's the definition of a quantile, so it's 0.5. And a more realistic example you can have here, let's say, you have to, let's go back to the notebook. So here you've got the minima, minimum for the convolution of a linear function with same cost for throwing away and uh, buying a pretzel. So, so this is it here. Okay, so find the minima. Minimum is at 16,308. And the median of the gamma distribution is, well, it's just, just was because of the binning um, of our convolution. So that works, and it proves, okay, our calculation is correct. Now we are going to take a different cost function. <coughs> We've got selling, not selling, a, losing customer costs us $2.5, and throwing away is still one euro, uh, one dollar. And, okay. And we define the cost function, and we convolute. And it's not clearly visible, but the minimum is at a different value. If we look at it, just looking for the minimal bin, we get, uh, where is it? Can I can't see the window scrolling. Ich bin am Ende, wieso kommt da kein Output? Ne, da müssten eher Output sein. Ah, okay. Our minimum is now at 25,000 and that's a 71% quantile of the distribution. So, if you do the calculation of the formula on, on the slide, you will get 0.7 as a best estimator for that problem. So, what do we learn? Depending on the problem, just predicting a mean or the median is not always the best guess. It always depends on the cost function. So if you can't 
and we learn our if our cost function is purely symmetric, it's uh, like this absolute function. It's always the median. If it's different, you have to, to look for a best guess like here, 71%, which, which is natural. It's it, if your prediction is too low, you won't sell any pretzels. So if you go to a higher quantile of your prediction, which is a distribution, your your minimal you have got minimal costs. So always saying okay, in the mean the mean is for example uh, we've got I don't know twenty thousand passengers exits. Okay, I will say twenty thousand, but in reality I need twenty five thousand for this cost function to be, to be at uh, the minimum. Questions? So, how far is this removed from, let's say, actual realistic use case? Uh, not, not very far. Um, uh, we've got a customer where we have to do a supply chain demand. We have to order some goods every day. And if we would use um, the mean or the 50% quantile, we would always have an out of stock situation in, in the in um, in the locations of the store, so it's very realistic. In actual, you you do a simulation. Um, you have got your prediction. You have got your, the the process at the customer, and you've got to take into account. Okay, you're not ordering every day, but let's say for one item every two days, another item every three days, and you have to find the best working point. Um, what's what's the prediction and what's the um, what prediction do you take into account and what's the number of goods you want to buy? So it's very realistic, it's just simplified here. Um, now the same uh, this model has some cyclic um, relationships, some stability, some trends in the in the realistic world, would you also have the ability to go for let's say cultural events, so if the station was closed or something like that? If you've got the data, yes. But it's hard to build a model if the station is closed once in a year, you know, I've got three years of data, and it's just one event. And if the event occurs um, five times a year, it's still hard. So, some okay. uh, it's, 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 we are always dealing with a problem, and our, and our customers are telling us, "Okay, you have to to know it's it's Christmas." Yes, we know it's Christmas, but with just three data points, and Christmas shifts with a combination of weekdays every seven or ten years. So, <laughs> so one challenge in addition to model selection would be to get the data when when they did a promotion, for example, and things. Also, like that. you have to get the data, but still, um, there's some interpretation from the customer. Okay, he thinks the thing. Uh, you've got the data, and everything's fine, but. Sometimes you're you're limited by the number of events, or still it's it's not um, it's, it's purely noise, and you've got you've got sometimes you have to say okay that's um, a single event and you, you know the correlation, but you cannot derive uh, a prediction from that. So. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Ah, not, not in this case. This is no. This is just constructed. Made the simplification that <laughs> passes by equals sales, because that I think that you could almost say that it's maybe a constant factor. Well, maybe could not. Be. Maybe there's absolutely yes. yes. Uh, this is something you would maybe if you make the next iteration of the model, uh, you would uh, you would look at yeah as you said uh, uh, holidays uh, weekends. And things like this, and model them explicitly. Actually, you want to, you have to take into account. Okay, those are more working people. Let's say businessmen going there, or more children. If there are children, you would sell ice cream. And if it's uh, don't know, <laughs> it, it depends on on the um, on on what what you want to know and what do you know <laughs> about about the situation of that station. So. It's in, in that model. It's just simplified. It's just an idea. What can you do with the data? Okay, we want to sell pretzels, hot dogs, and the New York subway has a lot of stations. So you would you have got a lot of data. You would would evaluate. Okay, the stations you would 
put a wagon there in summer and the other one in winter on weekdays and weeks you could just imagine that's a huge space of, pro of possibilities. That's a, that's a cool thing actually about the data set. Uh, you get these four hour intervals for every station for several years. Uh, and there's, in the data there's even, um, there are markers for on which line a station is. So you could maybe start trying to, to separate the, the influence uh, of the, the different lines. And you know, okay, some people exited the station before, how many people will exit at the other stations sometime after that, so. <laughs> okay, it's not fine enough, but if it's the station is <laughs> it's on the same line. Yeah. And if you, so the, the ARMA model maybe was um, a little bit much in terms of science. Uh, the author of the, the Python module is actually in the room, he's in the last row. So if you have uh, questions about that, when to use it, how it was done, things like that, just uh, walk up to him and ask him. Um, all right. Thank you so much for attending. Um, yeah.